Tutsia. He is the chairman of the Namibia Alumni Association chapter. He's doing fantastic work for us in Namibia for a couple of years now. He's holding the now network and the committee together. They regularly do testimonials at USB program information sessions. Yaki is a well-known speaker at the USB executive development graduations, which are unfortunately at this stage, we're not sure where we are with the graduations, the face-to-face -face graduations. Yaki, so I'm not sure what will happen in December, but your input there is always highly valued. The Namibia uh, chapter is one of our most active chapters and we really, really value their voluntary time that they share and do the work for us at the USB and keeping our alumni connected. Yaki is an MBA alum and is also director of Iveco Namibia or Africa Commercial Vehicles, if that's correct. And I would like to hand you over then to Yaki Kutsia, who will facilitate this webinar with Mr. Skalpinar. He will do the introductions for, for Skalpinar. Thank you, and over to you, Yaki. Thank you, Christelle. Uh, a very good morning to uh, the USB alumni team um, and all the participants. Um, it's a privilege to have everyone join us, and it's a privilege for me to introduce our guest speaker. Skalpina has served as a reverend for 30 years. During this time, he was moderator of the Dutch Reformed Church of Namibia for several terms. And he also served as the president of the Council of Churches um, of Namibia for one term. For the past five years, he has been the talent management executive at Kukovic group of companies in Namibia, that is one of the largest private companies um, in Namibia. And on a more personal level, Spock and I have been friends for 14 years, 10 of which he has helped our company with leadership development and self-mastery. Um, Spock, it's a, it's a real pleasure to have you here this morning. Um, you have had such a big impact um, on our company over the past 10 years as a part-time consultant. Um, and I know your career is also taking a new path um, from now on as full-time leadership and self-mastery consultant. We want to wish you all the best of luck with that. Um, we want to thank you on behalf of the USB and the Alumni Association for um, making the time available for us with this message. Um, all the best and uh, we wish you all the best for, for the future as well. Thank you. Over to you, Scott. Thank you, Yaki, and good morning. Um, it's cool to have you here. Um, imagine we are all over the place and still connected. That's really, really a privilege to have you here. Before I start, I want to put something right on the recitation form. My title was indicated as doctor. Uh, I'm not a doctor. I'm just Skalk, and, and I live to help people with self-mastery and with leadership development and ethical living and doing, and to facilitate stuckness. That is my heart. So <clears throat> it's my privilege to, to talk to you about, um, again, leadership in tough times, leadership against the arts. In, in um, recent literature, there is talks about the Black Swan event. Um, and that is a rare, beyond the territory of normal expectations event in history. And you will know that is the COVID-19 pandemic. It aggressively broke into our lives and made home in our lives and keep us in our homes. It left none of us untouched an event with large magnitude all over the world and consequences that we never, ever expected. It did not, to my understanding, not only brought with the pandemic illness, it also brought uncertainty and fear and constant and fast change and culture shifts and rumors and virtual fitness classes, imagine, 
economic turmoil and new and different habits. Oh, wearing masks, you name it. That is our new reality. In negative moments, we think that we are at the limits of human endurance, that we live on the edge, and that's the new now. Taylor Swift performed a beautiful song, Everything Has Changed, and that is the reality in which leadership has to operate. Now, during the last couple of years, we talked about leadership in a book of world. You know it. Volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. A high speed, difficult to discern and difficult to make decisions, complex and out of focus world in which we live and operate. The COVID-19 pandemic actually woke us up to the understanding that we did not actually have an idea about VUCA until now. Now we live in a VUCA world. It is uncomfortable to say the least, challenging. Everything is disrupted. Some of us lose our jobs and our income and, and we urgently need to apply our minds on how to go forward. Not, not only to survive, but to find new ways of doing, to thrive in a personal as well as organizational way. So <clears throat> let me start by telling you a real life story. A story about the guy with the name Ernest Shackleton, born in 1874, somewhere in Ireland. And as a young boy, he spent his time reading adventure magazines, fascinated by the idea of man mastering nature. And eventually, a dream was born to be the first explorer to reach the South Pole. Now, in the early 1900s, he came twice within the reaching distance without being able to make it, different reasons. His dream drowned in the Antarctic ice when another British explorer, Amundsen, reached the South Pole in 1911. But that became the birth of a new dream for Shackleton, to be the first explorer to cross the Antarctic from sea to sea. So he immediately started with the recruiting program and put up notices in London. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. 5,000 applied. Shackleton personally interviewed all of them. From which he chose in the end 27 men. He bought a boat, 44 meters in length, named it the Endurance, and loaded it with as much food as possible, coal, a couple of sledges, and dogs. And on the 5th of December 1914, that was the same day that England entered the World War I, they set out um, on their journey from the London Harbour. Well, it was a formidable undertaking. The Weddell Sea lies ahead of them, famous for its large and unpredictable ice flows in the overland journey, almost 3,000 kilometers, with temperatures down to minus 94.7 degrees Celsius. Icy winds of 320 kilometers per hour. Imagine yourself stranded in the Antarctic for a day. Oh, wow. Now, on the 19th of January, 1915, the Endurance got stuck in the ice of the Antarctic, again, within 160 kilometers from the South Pole. And for the next nine months, they lived on the boat. No communication with the outside world. 44 meters of living space, or lack thereof. The strong currents of the Weddell Sea carried the trap boat more than a thousand kilometers to the north and the west and the large ice blocks break apart and come back together with tremendous force, crushing the wooden ship in between. Now, Shackleton knew that the situation was terrible and dangerous, but he never let his men see his concern about this situation or his fears. He was constantly moving around, talking with individual crew members, while he stayed calm and confident. 
He instinctively knew that leaders are like thermostats. They set the temperature. Now, day in and day out, he, he used his presence and energy to convey positivity and assurance, insisting that everyone gathers each evening in the water room, telling jokes, singing along, and playing games. On the 25th of October, 1915, somewhere south of South America, the ice started to crush the endurance. The ship groaned and struggled, and Shackleton had to ask himself for the first time, can we stay where we are? Now, on the 27th of October, he ordered his men to abandon ship. The first night on the ice, the temperature fell to minus 20 degrees Celsius. Early the next morning, Shackleton called his men together and announced the new goal with the words, ship gone. Stores gone, so now we'll go home. A top example, to my mind, of agile leadership. He knew how to let go of former goals and embrace new ones, even if it is dramatically different. Now, a couple of days later, what remained of the endurance was sinking through the ice, and Shackleton and his men were stranded on the ice with three tiny lifeboats, the James Caird, the Dutty Docker and the Stancomb Wills, named after the biggest financial donors for the, for the expedition. For six months, that, be, that would be their street race, somewhere in the Antarctic on an ice plate as large as a rugby field. And on the ice, within four to five feet of snow and temperatures of minus 40, the minimum food and drinks and a couple of oil stoves and constantly the ice opened with large cracks underneath them, only to snap back with terrible falls. Antarctic storms, storm winds with snow and ice battered them for several days at a time and the killer whales who saw their shadows on the ice burst through the ice from underneath thinking it was some kind of easy prey. On two occasions, they tried to travel on the ice, but with no success. Day after day, another piece of ice breaks off and the earth becomes smaller and smaller, hundreds of kilometers from the nearest piece of land. So what an ideal situation to be in, wouldn't you agree? And then one day, Shackleton had to ask himself for the second time, can we stay where we are? So as he realized it became too dangerous, he had to ask himself, then can we stay where we are? And they killed the darts and 28 of them climbed in the three lifeboats and set out on the worst piece of sea in the whole world, the Weddell Sea. Winds of more than 300 km per hour and waves of more than 30 meters played with this tiny little boats. And as soon as the waves broke over them, the water froze in them. The surrounding water, zero degrees, hoping to reach one of two little islands somewhere in the dangerous ocean. Eventually, they landed on a barren piece of rock called Elephant Island, the first time in 497 days on solid land. They stayed for a couple of days, but Shackleton realized there will, be no, there will not be enough food on the island. And, and again, he asked the question, the third time, can we stay where we are? So he chose five guys and he took the one lifeboat, the James Caird, it was only seven meter long, and they set off again on the dangerous sea, trying to reach South Georgia, a tiny island more than 1,300 kilometers away. It's almost the distance from Ventuk to Cape Town. And they experienced the harshest conditions for 17 days and nights. And the fact that they survived and actually reached the small island, I think was nothing less than a miracle. So after a couple of days rest, Shackleton and two of the men climbed over a mountain range that had never been crossed in that during the night. They covered an extremely difficult, uncharted mountain over 48 kilometers in 36 hours. 
in at risk. But again, Shackleton had to ask, can we stay where we are? In the end, they reached a well station from where they could summon help. And on the 30th of August 1960, after a couple of failed attempts, they picked up the rest of the men on Elephant Island. And all 28 of them returned to England 21, 21 months later. So what a story. A story about volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. A story about leadership against the odds, leadership on the edge. A story I reckon full of lessons for living and leading against all odds. A story of can we stay where we are. So I, I would like, I would love to, to know what is your story? Your situation, I believe, differs a lot from that of Shackleton and his men. But we also live in a time in which every one of us will have to be an explorer. We live in a world in which there is no drafted maps available. A world in which the toolboxes of yesterday doesn't help us today. And what used to work no longer does. And what was true yesterday is not true any longer today. The answers we had last week is not answers for this week. So I imagine our story as leaders will have to tell about agility and guts and integrity and calmness and positivity and resilience, endurance. So how can the, how can the story of Shackleton help leaders in post-COVID-19 if there will be a post-life in 2020? What lessons can we learn to help us to negotiate 2020 and its challenges? In an interview with the Pearson's magazine in 1916, Shackleton said, what he was looking for during the interviews before the expedition was, in the first place, optimism. So perhaps we could learn from Shackleton that optimism does not come from my situation, but irrespective of my situation. That optimism is a life approach, an attitude. Do you know that you communicate with yourself approximately 50,000 times per day? And 80% thereof is negative. Things like, no, I cannot. Why did I do that? They do not like me. I cannot see this through. I will not be able. It's like, it's like we have a built-in critic. The so life asks for the art of replacing this bold in critic with a bold in trainer someone that constantly reminds me you can so what about you will, will you write in your diary in mid 2020 regardless of your situation your challenges perhaps you've lost your job perhaps you've lost half of your income perhaps you've lost your business um, whatever. Can, will you write in your diary, I am full of hope and optimism? Will you refuse to give up and lie down, even in the eye of adversity? If not, may I dare to ask you, can you stay where you are? The second thing that Shackleton was looking for in his men was integrity. Through the whole ordeal, Shackleton frequently talks about what do we need? How should we be? What shall we need to have a future? He never asked this men something that he was not prepared to do himself. He leads his men by taking part. He risks his life. On the passage to, to Elephant Island, Shackleton tied the smaller Stankoke wells to, to his boat and Afraid he could lose his men in the dark, he kept his hand on the rope for the whole of the night. On the ice plates, where they tried to get some sleep, he walked up and down between the tents to look out for cracks in the ice. 
And one of his men later wrote, if there is danger, he goes first. So Shackleton taught his men while teaching himself to face and outface fear, demonstrates the deepest base of integrity, to be whom you say you are, even when it costs you something. Now in my younger days, my wife and I were on holiday in Spokkelmund, and, and holiday means to me doing stuff that I really like doing and seldom I have time to do. So tennis and cycling and kayaking, and therefore I'm sort of constantly hungry. So one lunchtime, we went to the main street in Swakop and looking for something nice to eat and, and we find a place with a menu in the door and scanning that in an instant, I knew this is the place. But then I tried to open the door and nothing happens. And I tried the second time, but the door stays closed. And it was then when I noticed on a hand written sign on the, on the door, out for lunch. Can you believe it? Out for lunch. Out to see to your own needs and, and that while people for whom you exist, hungry people, stand in front of the door with a sign on the door, out for lunch. The reason for existence for a restaurant is to my mind is to give food to hungry people. Isn't that true? Especially at those times, people normally are hungry and want to eat something. But the moral of the story? Be true to yourself. Be who you say you are. And do what you say you would do. Keep your word. Keep your commitments. And make sure that your morning and evening stories are consistent. So my question is, does people see integrity when they see you. And my dear, if not, can you stay where you are? The third characteristic Shackleton was looking for, according to the Pearson's magazine, was idealism. The strong belief that things can get better. There is something better. There is a tomorrow I can dream about tomorrow. The Shackleton used the humor and music and singing and poetry and stories to boost idealism amongst these men. During the bitter cold and dangerous nights, he was often doing tent visits to his men. He envisioned a photographic record of the expedition and therefore hired a photograph. photograph. He sold the film and, and photo rights from, um, before the journey, from the journey. So do, do you look at your, your situation? And, your current situation and to really believe that things can get better. So do you dream about tomorrow? And even more, do you help other people to believe there is a tomorrow? Do you help them to release their dreams? Because that's the job of leaders. And my dear, if not, can you stay where you are? The fourth thing that Shackleton uh, was looking for was moral courage, endurance. He was looking for endurance. His own family motto was, was by endurance we conquer. And that was words he tested every day of this trip. In his diary, he constantly wrote patience and patience and patience. And with that, he mean endurance, not a passive hanging in there, boys, but an active, working, let's, just, let's make it a better world attitude. Shackleton called that moral courage. And when the endurance was trapped by the ice for nine months, and they lived on the ice for a further six months, battled with the sea with no communication to the outside world, under the harshest circumstances, it was the moral courage of the men who helped them through. They just didn't give up. For a year and a half, the reality was that of hope and setback and danger, and hope and setback and danger. The moment they thought that things are changing their, their way, their hopes were utterly dashed, dashed time upon time. So perhaps above anything else, it was Shackleton's resilience his grit that pulled him through. Time and time again, 
He bounced back and took his men with him. He walked and pulled and pushed and studied and listened. He never hung. He realized it's going, if it's going to be, it's up to me. So something from the inside he helped him to hang in, to survive against all the odds. So endurance is to, to my understanding, to, to have grit. Um, that is the passion and perseverance over the long haul, a sort of a, of a steely determination, a long-term tenacity to keep on going until you cross the finish line. So gritty people overcome obstacles. They don't quit. They expect the process to be difficult, like we experience now, but they can overcome whatever obstacle in their way. There's a children's story out of my childhood, the little engine that put, perhaps you know it. There was a town somewhere full of kids without toys. And somebody decided to send them a train load full of toys. And then in the neighboring town, the train got stuck. And the reason was there was a high mountain to overcome between the, the two towns. And the locomotive said, it is not possible. We cannot, we cannot go over the mountain. At last, the small shunting locomotive on the station, with not much power, said, I will do it. And they woke up, and in the end, the journey started. Going up the mountain, the little engine puffed. I think I can. I think I can. And slowly but surely, over the top, and and then you could hear on the other side of the mountain, I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could. So all the kids received toys and they happily lived and played thereafter. That's how the story like that is. So how was your situation at work, at home? What about you? It, it is so easy to give up, to raise the white flag, to life and its challenges, and to say, I cannot, it is not possible, instead of saying, I think I can, I think I can, and that would become, I thought I could, I thought I could. So endurance is to, to be knocked down and to be able to bounce back. So is your life at this stage merely a, a hang in there situation? Or is it an active, pulsing, working, pushing, pulling, studying, listening, endurance? And my idea again, if not, can you stay where you are? I also want to focus your attention on a couple of things that Shackleton did right through this extremely tough time. During these 21 months, Shackleton also did a couple of things which, to my understanding, no leader can be without. He listened, he communicated, he cared for and blessed his men, he enforced sabbaticals, he inspired confidence and hope, and he impersonated agility. Shackleton listened. To give ear to something is to pay attention and learn. Shackleton listened to the sounds of the Antarctic the cracking of the ice, the vibrations in the air, the howling or whispering of the winds, the voices of birds and the animals, and he listened to his men, to their dreams, to their anxieties, to their desires, to their fear. And he read them like this. And he demonstrated to my mind that leadership is about listening to the whole. He knew them. And he knew what were their strengths and their weaknesses. And that was life preserving for himself and his 27 men. So friends, I believe that awareness, that is listening and hearing, is the core competency of leadership. If we want to do better as leaders, we must learn the art of listening listening to the sounds, 
to the voices, to the cracking, to the lamenting of the world around us and act on that. I think in this difficult time, we must realize as leaders that we have to hear our way forward. That's our challenge, to give ear. If not, can you stay where you are? Shackleton communicated. He had a contingency of plans for each crew member in case of an emergency. And these orders were written up and posted on the tents where the men were staying. And he responded to every situation. He gave feedback, he rewarded the tribute if necessary. During the nights on sea, he flashed the compass line and the cells on the cells of the James Care. And he went into the tents and had personal discussions. And it started nowhere else than to start hearing better. Shackleton was an expert in that. Do the people in your life see the flashing of the compass now? The leader's job is constant hearing, constant communicating, and continuous feedback loops. If not, can you stay where you are? Shackleton cared for his men and, and blessed them. I think of almost equal importance to his absolute resilience was his care, his, his obsession for the well-being of his men. It was never about him, his ego. He was devoted to his men. He viewed his relationship to his men as his number one priority. And that was a deep, caring relationship that brought out the very best in everyone. During the journey to the Elephant Island, the photographer lost his mittens, so Shackleton gave him his and his fingers became frostbitten. And when they made land in South Georgia, they were too tired to pull the boat all the way in, so Shackleton stayed with the boat and let the men sleep. And when they marched over the mountain, Shackleton was in thin leather ski boots because he had given his warm expedition boots to one of the others. Let me tell you another short story. A young medical doctor went to a remote tribe in the north of America to work under the Indians. And he stayed for a couple of years and then decided to go back to his people. And at the farewell, party, the chief son asked, you want to say something? And he went over to the doctor and, and said in his broken English, I like me most when I am with you. And that's a story about blessing both ways, bringing out the best in others. So how can you be a blessing to others today? Do you help people around you to like themselves most when they are with you? And may I dare to ask you, if not, can you stay where you are? Shackleton in four sabbaticals, after the most strenuous day, he pulled out the rest day, if it was possible in any way. A day of replenishing, in their case, a day of sleep and rest and eat. And he kept his team as energized and strong as possible. So most of us, I believe, have tight schedules, long working days, responsibilities and must-dos at home. And few of us seem to get enough rest, rushing from the one thing to the other, ending up drained and tired and without any passion for life or passion for what we are doing. We need time outs. No, not necessarily a whole day off thing, also that, but, but many sabbaticals where I take some time to clean the windscreen of my life. Time outs, which are sometimes filled with stillness and silence and other times filled with nurturing activities, which refill my energy day. So we need to stop and listen and connect, not only to the outside world, but also to our inner thoughts. So do you make timeouts? Do you take sabbaticals? And if not, my dear, ask you, can you stay where you are? 
Certainly inspired confidence. One of the outstanding characteristics in, in this incredible leadership story was that Shackleton never lost his calmness. That helped him to have an eye on the whole situation and to constantly reflect on alternatives and stay creative through the whole ordeal. Above all, it was his calmness that inspired trust and kept his men together, whatever the circumstances were. In adversity, leaders cannot afford to lose their calmness. More than ever before, we need leaders now that stay calm in this difficult and challenging and uncertain situations. Leaders will have to define reality in an ongoing basis. Leaders have to constantly reflect on alternatives and be able to bring creativity to every challenge. Clear thinking, even under extreme pressure, will be needed going forward. That will only be possible through calm leadership. Shackleton never showed his own anxiety and fear because he knew as the leader, he set the temperature. He knew that the displaying of any negative emotion from his side, would that be fear or anger, or irritation, would affect his people negative. He acted as the morning star. Like the morning star, his presence and calmness announced, hey, do you know that? The day is coming. A new day is at hand. So it symbolizes hope and guidance towards a new day. So do you realize that you set the temperature? Could be at home, could be at work, could be between your friends, could be in your marriage. Do you realize that you set the temperature? If not, can you stay where you are? Well, a last thought, if you will allow me. Shackleton shows that what it means to be agile when leading on the edge. In time again, situations change. From the beginning, he missed the opportunity to be the first explorer to reach the South Pole. What did he do? He immediately pursued a new, the next dream to cross the Antarctic. And when the endurance got stuck in the ice and being devoured by the ice, he began became to take his men safely home. And when they could not make a success of two attempts marching over the ice to reach open water, they took the little boats and negotiated the journey at sea against all odds. And when they reached Elephant Island and he realized that they couldn't stay there, he tackled the almost impossible journey through the Weddell Sea to South Georgia. And when they landed at South Georgia, on the opposite from where the world station was situated, they crossed a difficult mountain in an impossible time. An extreme example, to my understanding, of leading on the limits of human endurance and embracing complete disruption, being agile, being resilient, being calm and caring. Namibia has never needed real leaders more than it does now. So please be the leader that you are called to be. I believe that, uh, friends, that um, change and growth happens only uh, when we reflect on experiences. So may I ask you to reflect for a moment on what is the one lesson from the Shepherdton story that touches you the deepest. What is the one lesson? And how will it change your life if you apply it to your own leadership? So what is the, what is the one lesson above everything that you will take home? And how will it change your life if you apply it to your own leadership? I think that's my first question that I want you to reflect on. And together with that, how would it change other people's lives? People in your team, the people in your business, 
the people in your family, how they change their lives. And may I ask you to look forward three to six months. What future do you want to create for yourself and the people you lead? So what is the ideal picture in your mind? What future do you want to create for yourself and the people you lead? And then lastly, if you have to make that a reality, what practical first steps would you take on in the next 48 hours? What is the, what is the one practical thing that you would do in the next 48 hours to create the ideal future for yourself and the people you lead. My prayer is that may God bless you all and that He blessed us in such a way that we can be a blessing for everyone that we lead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yaki. Thank you, Scott. Um, I, I think the timeliness of your talk could not have come um, at a better time. There is so much uncertainty. Um, it is not only the, the pace of change that I think is um, mm. keeping leaders awake at night, um, it's also the magnitude thereof. Um, and I know my, my context is business, but I know there are many other spheres of leadership in government, uh, at churches, um, mm -hmm. at home, where, where leaders are really struggling with um, <clears throat> what, is, what is happening in our world and where, where our world is heading. We've had a, a, couple, of, <clears throat> we've had a couple of questions from, um, from participants. I think that's your job to answer the question, isn't it? <laughs> no, I'll ask them. I'll leave that to you. And so you mentioned earlier in your talk about the book our world. If I remember that correctly, that's it's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Mm -hmm. So we are all experiencing that, um, and we are all from time to time. If, if the rest of the leaders feel like me, freaking out a bit um, because. <laughs> yeah. Because it doesn't stop. It drives us crazy. Yes. Um, then yeah. we're in lockdown, then we're not in lockdown, yeah. then businesses are open and then they are closing. So one of the questions from the participants was, how do you create stability in the, in the, in the local world? Um, the reality thereof, we cannot dispute, but, but how do you train yourself to remain calm and create stability in such a world? <coughs> Okay, that, that's uh, indeed a difficult question because it's a difficult task to, to stay calm. Um, and and um, I, I think that um, what is working for me is not necessarily uh, that, that it would work for you. But, but for me, the, the whole sabbatical thing works really well. If, if, I, uh, if I do feel that I'm getting stressed out, um, I I take some time out um, and whether it is listening to good music or whether it is to take my mountain bike and, and do a short ride in nature, uh, whatever um, that you need to restore your calmness. Because I think we all know that um, if, you, if you really get stressed out, your brain cannot do a good job. Um, then your brain Without going into the into the detail, your your brain um, only has the the ability to either freeze or flee or fight. So you can't make do good um, decisions when you are stressed out. So I really think it is it is very very important. And and together with that, um, calmness um, really set the temperature in my environment. If if I'm the one that is um, that's cracking when, when the heat is up, um, that is the temperature, that will be the temperature in my team also. So um, 
I, I hope that's the answer. Um, for me, there's some practical things that work and, and I think I would like to challenge you to go out and, and to see what is the things that help you at the best to stay calm. I don't think there's a recipe. Okay, no, that, that makes sense. I think it is a, it's a good answer. We've had, we've had one more um, answer, oh, another question from the participants. So you, you mentioned in your talk the attributes that Shackleton was looking for when he recruited the STEM of it. Mm -hmm. I remember one was positivity, the other one was uh, integrity. Are, are there more than this, this one? So the, the first one, um, and that's according to the interview that, that was uh, being held with him in 1916 after they returned to London. The first one was optimism. That's the, that is the, um, um, to, to, to know that, um, that my situation um, does not speak the last word. Um, Optimism doesn't come from, from my situation, but uh, it is a thing that comes from the inside. And then the second thing was in integrity, which I think we dearly need in our society. Um, if we, oh my goodness, um, if we look at life in the corporate world, if we, if we look at um, the whole, in our country, the fish rod saga, um, where millions and millions perhaps billions of money was was um was um i i don't think i must use the word in the ear perhaps there's something somebody would want to sue me but but um i think integrity is is really really um well um still went through the, went through the windows of our societies and then the third thing was was idealism the, the whole believe that things can get better. Um, it will be better than it was yesterday and, and this morning. And the fourth thing that, that he named was, was endurance or moral courage to, to have grit. Um, not a passive um, hang in there, but an active working let us make this a better attitude. So that was the four things that uh, apparently he said in the uh, interview interview after they reached them after the 21 months or the thank you i that i think it, it makes sense the, the question